Chapter 1 It had been three months since the day Wrecker found the body of Susan Hanley stuffed in the trunk of her Honda Civic. Against his better judgment, he never sought revenge or retribution for the killing of Mia's friend. Though he disagreed with the professor's feelings, he nevertheless went along with Jones's desires. Wrecker pledged that if the police hadn't solved the murder and arrested the culprit by this time, that he'd get back on the case to do his own justice. Unfortunately for him, his own cases seemed to be never-ending, and he couldn't get back to the investigation of Hanley's murder. In the last couple of months, Wrecker never even had more than one day off just to relax, let alone the time he'd need to look into the Hanley case. Though he didn't know the Hanley woman personally, with her being a friend of Mia's, it ate away at Wrecker that a killer was out there on the loose. Mia asked him constantly if he had the time to work on her friend's death. Over the past three months, she'd become increasingly frustrated over the lack of police progress on the situation. Every time she called the police to speak to the investigators, she felt like they were giving her the runaround. She felt like they were nowhere near solving the case, and she was sure they weren't even investigating it anymore. They didn't seem to have any leads, and she wondered if they'd just moved on to other cases that they felt were more solvable. Even though she had pestered Wrecker at least three times a week to inquire about Hanley's case, he tried not to get too annoyed by it, even though it sometimes took his focus off the cases he was working on now. He understood how frustrated she'd become. He felt it too. Sitting in the diner of Joe's, one of their frequent meeting places, Wrecker could only assume that the Hanley case would be one of the first things that Mia brought up. Though she hadn't mentioned it the day before when she asked him to meet her for lunch, he figured he was going to hear questions about it today. Since she was running a few minutes late due to traffic, she'd already texted him to let him know she'd be there soon. Sitting there by himself, though, gave Wrecker some time to himself to think. With all the cases he'd been working lately, and how busy he was, just taking a few minutes to think was something he didn't get much time to do. Wrecker looked out the window and watched a younger couple getting into their car. For some reason, possibly the woman's blonde hair that bore a striking resemblance to Carrie's, his thoughts turned back to her. He thought about a few of the good times that they'd shared together. But those thoughts quickly turned darker when he thought about that fateful night back in London. He replayed the conversation he had with Agent 17 in his mind over and over again. Though he was looking out the window, he wasn't seeing anything. In his mind, he was picturing what Agent 17 looked like as he had that conversation over the phone. Wrecker clenched his jaw tighter as his body embraced the tension that was flowing through him. Then, the image he had of Agent 17 slowly faded away as Wrecker's mind turned to other things. He thought about the professor's software program that was supposed to be helping find and identify Carrie's killer. With how busy they'd become, Wrecker had put the search out of his mind as he focused on helping the people in the city he was now in. But as he sat there thinking about it, he was becoming more agitated at the fact that Jones still hadn't found Agent 17 yet. Of course, the professor could have found him already, and he just didn't want to reveal it to Wrecker yet with the amount of cases they had on the table. But Wrecker also knew that Jones was reluctant to participate in the search anyway. He was starting to think that unless he pestered Jones continuously about it, that the professor would never make it a priority. Jones would always find a way to put it on the back burner if Wrecker let him. Wrecker thought about the last time he asked about how the search was going. It had probably been about a month, and it was only in passing, as they were in the middle of another kidnapping case. He remembered Jones not saying much about it, just indicating that they were close. As he sat there thinking about it, he determined that when lunch with Mia was done, he was going back to the office to confront Jones about his lack of haste in finding what was so important to Wrecker. He would accept no excuses or delays, and he wasn't going to take no for an answer. After all, finding Agent 17 was one of the conditions Wrecker insisted on when he agreed to join Jones's crusade. If he didn't like Jones's answer, then Wrecker would seriously consider leaving on the spot to go find the one person on Earth he hated like no other. Wrecker was so deep in thought that he never even saw or heard Mia sit down across from him. 
She hurriedly rushed into the diner and sat down, knowing that Wrecker usually didn't have an overabundance of time on his hands. Once she settled in, she sighed and looked at him, noticing that he was looking out the window. Mia glanced out herself, wondering if something was going on out there. Not noticing anything strange, she looked back at him, curious as to what was going through that mind of his. In the time that they'd known each other, she noticed that he sometimes seemed to get lost in another moment, and she often wondered just exactly where his mind went. Mia cleared her throat, hoping the noise would awaken him from whatever trance he was in, but he still paid her no mind. Though part of her wasn't sure whether she should wake him, as part of her worried that in these moments of his, he was taken back to some violent moment in his life. Seeing Wrecker's hand resting on the table, she reached her hand across and gently placed it on top of his. Feeling her touch, his concentration was broken, and he turned to look at her, somewhat surprised to see her sitting there. Hey, when'd you get here? he asked. Oh, like an hour ago, Mia teased. Really? No, I just got here a minute ago. Oh, I didn't even notice you come in. Yeah, I could tell. Everything okay? she said, sensing that he wasn't totally there. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about something. Anything you want to talk about? Nope. Thought so. They ordered some food and spent the next few minutes small talking, neither saying anything of much substance. Mia figured she'd wait a little while until she dropped the news on him, as she was sure he wouldn't like what she had to tell him. She waited until they finished eating before she spat out what was on her mind. Part of her was nervous to talk to him about it, knowing he would vehemently disapprove of her actions. Have you heard anything about Susie's case lately? She said, keeping her tone light deliberately and running her fingers through her hair as a distraction. Wrecker just shook his head. No, nothing new. Police still don't seem to have any leads to work from. They don't seem to be trying very hard. I know it's tough for you, Wrecker said. Yeah, that's why I started doing something about it on my own. Wrecker squinted his eyes slightly, unsure what she meant, but not liking the sound of it. What exactly have you done? I started looking into some things. Such as? Just going through her contacts, appointments, and clients to see if she had a relationship with anybody outside of work. Or maybe if any of them have a particularly violent past. Mia said, squirming uncomfortably on her seat, in readiness for Wrecker's response. Wrecker made a face and sighed, clearly unhappy. Mia, we've already done that. When we were looking for her, we checked the backgrounds of all her clients. Only a couple had any type of criminal background, and those that did were home at the time she disappeared. I know. That's why I dug a little further. You what? She cleared her throat as she explained. Even when Wrecker didn't try to be, knowing his past history, he could be an intimidating figure. And she knew he didn't approve of anything she said or was about to say. I started digging into the backgrounds of some of the relatives of some of her clients, Mia stated. Mia? Don't Mia me. One of my best friends. Someone I've known since college. Someone I was roommates with was killed and stuffed in a car, she said, on the verge of crying. It's been three months since she was found, and nobody, including you, seems to give a damn about what happened to her. The police don't seem to care. You give me the runaround, what else am I supposed to do? Knowing she was frustrated, Wrecker tried to be patient with her. I know you're hurt and angry, but you can't do this. Why? To be perfectly honest, you don't know what you're doing. Well, someone has to do something. Nobody else is. Let the authorities handle it. We both know that if they haven't found out who did it by now, the odds are only going to get worse as time moves on, Mia said. Maybe. But you're not equipped to do this. Well, I've already started. I can't just go on living, knowing that Susie's killer is out there roaming the streets and no one seems to care. I told you that I would start looking into it as soon as I got some free time, Wrecker said, trying hard to sound patient. Which is never. Mike, you never have free time. It almost takes an act of God for you just to take a few minutes to have lunch with me. 
she replied in frustration. Wrecker looked down at the table. The comment stung a little bit, even though he knew she wasn't wrong and was well within her rights to feel that way. Mia read his face and saw that she'd hurt him a little bit with her words. I'm... I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, Mia said. Yes, you did. It's okay, you're not wrong. I know you're busy and you have a lot on your plate. Not that you ever talk much about what's on it. But I know you're stretched thin already, and I've already asked you more than I should about it. And I know it's not your job to look into my own personal things, so I'm not even going to ask you anymore. Wrecker took a few seconds to think of something to try and convince her not to pursue her intentions any further. What do you think's going to happen if you actually find something? Wrecker asked. If I get close enough to actually start putting some pieces together, then I'll take what I've learned to the police. If you get that far. What's that supposed to mean? Mia wondered. Because you're not a trained investigator? You're not experienced in this line of work. You make one wrong move, take one wrong step, and it could be the last. If you start looking into things and ruffle the wrong feathers, you might be the next one that's stuffed in the trunk of a car, Wrecker warned. I'm willing to take that chance. I'm not willing to let you take that chance. Mike, you're not going to stop me, she told him. I'm not going to let you do this and possibly get yourself killed. Would it really matter to you? Wrecker leaned back, trying not to let her hurtful words get to him. He knew it was more frustration and emotion talking than anything. You know I care about you, or else I wouldn't be here, Wrecker said. I know. I shouldn't have said it. I guess I'm not feeling myself today, she sorrowfully replied. I promise you that I will start looking into it. When? As soon as I get some time. Mia rolled her eyes and sighed, weary from hearing that line before. I know you mean well, Mike, but I don't want to wait forever for you. I'm going to keep looking into things on my own. If you get some free time tomorrow or next week or next month, that's great, but I can't wait for you. Wrecker also sighed, knowing there was nothing he could say that was going to change her mind. They sat there for a few more minutes, mostly in silence, both of them rather uncomfortable after their exchange. Eventually, Mia excused herself, saying she had to go home and get ready for work, having the night shift. Wrecker wasn't sure she was being truthful, or whether she was about to do something that both of them would regret by investigating on her own. Wrecker didn't take his eyes off her as she walked out of the diner. He watched out the window as Mia got into her car and drove away. Wrecker sat there for a little while longer, just thinking about the conversation they just had. He felt like he had let Mia down. He thought he should have done what he wanted to do in the first place and bring Hanley's killer to justice. If he had, then Mia wouldn't be in the obvious amount of pain that she was. Wrecker didn't blame her a bit for the way she was talking or feeling. He thought back to how he felt in the days after he learned that somebody had killed Carrie, or the pain that he was still feeling. He didn't think that losing a friend, even a close one, was comparable to losing a wife or husband, a parent, a child, or even a brother or sister. But he knew the pain could still be severe. Severe enough for somebody to do something that they shouldn't. Something such as seeking revenge or trying to investigate matters on their own when they were clearly out of their element. He knew he couldn't let her do what she was planning, at least not alone. Wrecker was the only one who could help her outside of the police, who seemed to have put the case on the back burner. He was going to go back to the office immediately to let Jones know that he had to get back on the case and insist that it wasn't up for debate. He knew the professor would likely try to talk him out of it once more, but Wrecker couldn't let that happen again. And while he was at it, he was going to have a much sterner conversation about the whereabouts and progress, or lack thereof, about Agent 17. Wrecker was through waiting and getting the runaround. There was something tugging at him that Jones had already found Agent 17 and was just holding off on telling him out of fear that Wrecker would leave immediately. Once Wrecker got back to the office, Jones could instantly tell something was wrong. Wrecker had the face of someone who was about to blow his cool, a mad scowl seeming to be permanently attached. 
Brecker walked up to the desk and stopped, not saying a word. He just stared at the professor. I was going to ask how your lunch was, but by the look of your face, I'd say it didn't go so well, Jones stated. We need to have a talk. Oh? Jones asked, fearful of the subject they were about to embark on. About? Two different subjects, Brecker answered. I take it one of them will involve Mia? It does. Okay, let's start with that then, Jones said. What exactly is the problem with her? She's hurting and she's angry. It's been three months and nobody seems to give a damn that her friend was killed. We both know that's not the case, isn't it? Wrecker asked. If you'd have let me done what I wanted to do when I found her body, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now. We both know that it was for the best we left it alone. No, we don't know that. I don't. The police have put the case on the back burner. You told me yourself, the last time you hacked into police files the other day, that they hadn't even updated the case files in a month, Wrecker said. They've moved on. We had other cases. Our own cases to work on, Jones responded. As I said, we're not in the revenge business. But we are in the helping business. And right now we need to help Mia. In what regards? She's out there investigating on her own. She started talking to people and looking at things, Wrecker revealed, getting a sigh out of Jones, who knew that was a bad idea. So what do you suggest? Jones asked. We both know that she's not going to let this go. And it might not be right away. Maybe it'll take some time. But we both know she's intelligent, resourceful, stubborn, and persistent. Eventually, if she pursues this, and she will, she's going to strike a nerve with someone. She'll talk to someone who knows something, and that someone will get jumpy. And that's going to put her in danger. Though Jones empathized with Wrecker's position, he wasn't so sure the situation was as dire as his friend was predicting. After all, Mia wasn't a trained investigator. Jones wasn't sure she'd get far into her investigation at all. At the risk of sounding cold-hearted and uncaring, what makes you so sure that she won't give up after a week? Despondent that she's unable to turn up anything of consequence, Jones wondered. Like I said, she's strong-willed. She's angry and she's hurting. That's not a good combination. Trust me, I've been there. Comparing the two of you is not quite the same thing. One of you is a trained assassin skilled in the art of this type of warfare, and one of you is a nurse. That hardly compares. Maybe so. But I'm telling you, she will not let this go, Brecker warned. I think you're being a bit presumptuous in how far she can take this and what kind of danger she uncovers. For all we know, it was a completely random act of violence against Ms. Hanley, someone who she never met before that incident. Someone who could be in an entirely different state by now, Jones rebuffed. You don't really believe that, do you? What? That it was random, Brecker answered. I really have no idea, and neither do you. I know it wasn't random. Whoever did it was someone she knew. And how do you know that? She was strangled, then shot, then stuffed in the trunk of her car. There's nothing random about that. That's at the hands of someone who's made it personal. That's someone who's angry, Brecker told him. A stranger wouldn't bother to go through the hassle of doing all those things. Perhaps you're right. But I don't think we can spare the time right now to look into the case. I know that's what you're suggesting, Jones replied. I'm not suggesting. I'm telling you I'm back on the case. Jones looked despondent, knowing that he was losing the argument. He knew that Wrecker would put Mia's interests ahead of any other cases they were working on at the moment and was worried that other people would get hurt in the meantime, things that could have been prevented if they weren't sidetracked with personal entanglements. And to what end are you going to pursue this? Jones asked. What do you mean? Well, how long do you plan to work on this? As long as it takes, Wrecker answered. And what happens if you find the person who did this? Just turn the information over to the police? I'll finish the case my way. Which means what? I'll put two bullets in their head, Wrecker bluntly replied. Then it'll be over. That's not how we're supposed to operate, 
That's how I operate. And what of our other cases? Jones wondered. There are other people out there who need help as well. I can work more than one case at a time. I can help them while helping Mia at the same time. Would you be doing this if it was someone other than Mia? Of course not, Wrecker responded. I thought so. Listen, she's a friend, and I care about her. I'm not about to let her get mixed up in something that she's ill-equipped for and unprepared to handle. And no, it's not because I'm falling in love with her. I know that's floating around somewhere in that head of yours. Just making sure I know where you stand on things, Joan said. I would do the same thing for you if it was you in her shoes, Wrecker told him. Jones knew that there was nothing he could say or do that would change Wrecker's mind. Though he still wasn't sure that Mia would find the danger that Wrecker expected her to find, Jones had never seen him so persistent on anything before. There was no talking him out of it. And he knew better than to keep trying and fighting a losing game. He did worry about what would happen if Wrecker did find the culprit of Hanley's murder. It was now personal to Wrecker, and Jones hoped that he wouldn't get careless and make a mistake that would somehow compromise the two of them or their operation. When exactly do you plan on starting this little side escapade of yours? Jones asked. No time like the present, Wrecker replied. Very well, then. I guess we need to get started, then, don't we?